Okay, let's start the session now. Uh, good morning and welcome you all in this AJ900 session. Myself, Archie Dixon. I'm your host for this session. Guys, if you have any question and queries, please put question on chat box. We will there to help you out. Uh, now moving ahead and talking about our event sponsor that is Synergetics. So Synergetics India, one of kind co-porting running solution company. Now you will get a question like who we are and what we do, what we doing. So answering your question, we do so our offering and also give comprehensive advisory service to client who wish to modernize their framework. We educate, advise, implement, and manage. Then the Synergetics solution offering that is persona based onboarding solution, onboarding add-on solution, certification solution, certification add-on solution, reskilling solution, imaging technology training solution, certification hackathon solution, cloud adoption solution, latest technology training solution, sales pre-sales training solution, practice playbook solution, and architecting solution. Then what this Microsoft certification does, it will give you complete learning experience. You will get trained to appear for the exam and get certified. This is skilling journey here. You can advance yourself. First, you have to complete fundamental certification. Then you can go with the advanced role based certification and expert level certification. In fundamental certification, we are providing you AJ 900, AI 900, DP 900, PL 900 and SC 900. In associate level certification, we are providing you many types of certification. Uh, here you can see on my screen. In expert level certification, we are providing you four types of certification. AZ305, SC100, PL600 and AZ400. Also, we have special certification uh, that is AZ120, AZ44140, AZ220. And certification offering. Certification will help you to increase your visibility, expand your knowledge and skills. We do provide certification add-on, onboarding add-on like short duration modules and more. Moving ahead and today training is organized and handled by the ATC community. So our ATC community is open to all the people who are interested in our cloud technology and various emerging technology. Under ATC community, we have emerging technology community for all. Azure Tech community for Punekas. Emerging technology community for Suratkas. Azure Tech community for Nagpur. Guys, you just have to install the meetup and you can follow our communities there. Then you have to follow code of conduct, which will create a respectful environment for all the participants. Please note that participants are not allowed to take screenshot of the presentation and cannot do screen recording. We will try to upload this training on our official YouTube channel. Speaker for this training, Mr. Sonu Satyadas. He is a Microsoft certified trainer and currently work with Synergetics as a practice head. Agenda for this webinar, you will get to know more about the topic and benefit of it. In this session, we are providing you AZ900 complimentary learning achievement badge. Here you can see the step. You just have to follow the step and you will get the activated badge. Make sure, guys, you don't forget to sub follow us on our LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube for upcoming update and information. Thank you. Now I would like to hand over this mic, our speaker. He will continue ahead. Yeah, hello, Archie. Am I audible? Mm, yes, sir. Okay. So, hello, everyone. Good morning. I hope it's uh, audible to all of you. This side, Sonu Satyadas. Uh, I am the practice head and assistant manager for technology at Synergetics. So I'm sharing my screen. You can confirm whether you are able to see it. So this session is uh, all about the fundamentals of AZ900. This session 
comes in the fundamentals category as uh, she has explained you. There are different uh, fundamentals certifications. We have different uh, associate level certifications. And also we have expert level certifications. This is not the complete list of certifications, but yes, you can see. If you are new to cloud and the cloud based technologies. Like. Uh, AI data science or uh, the cloud computing. Then you can go with the fundamental certification. The fundamental certification. You can take an exam. You can. Go through the Microsoft learn modules. And this. Fundamental certifications for AI. For Azure and the data will give you a complete understanding about the basic concepts. So in case of Azure fundamentals, it will help you to understand what is cloud, the types of cloud services, the different uh, types of uh, Azure services we have, the features and functionalities, hosting, building, then the uh, core components or core services in the Azure. In case of AI, if you are interested to go ahead with the AI concepts, you can start with the Azure AI fundamentals, which is AI 900, which will give you a basic understanding of the artificial intelligence. And in case of data, that means if you are interested in data engineer or data science certifications, you can start with the fundamental course that is data, which provide good understanding about the services required for data services. Once you have completed the fundamentals, you can take the associate level certification. It depends on your persona. You can choose the appropriate certifications. If you are uh, interested in the infrastructure management, you can go ahead with the Azure administration, which is AZ104 certification. But if you are interested in application development, you can go ahead with the Azure Developer Certification, which is also an associate level certification that uh, give you the, uh, so the, the core pass services required for building the cloud-based applications. And we also have certifications uh, from different other platforms like uh, Power Platform certifications, data scientists. And also we have uh, specialized the certifications on security, database, and networking. Once you complete the associate level certification, you can go ahead with the expert level of certification, which is the solutions architect that is AZ305 or the DevOps engineer that is AZ400. Which. Give you an expert level badge, which. Uh, helps you to design and implement. The cloud solutions. So these are the different uh, certification options we have. This is not the complete list of certification because this is some basic. Uh, this will give you a basic understanding about the Microsoft certifications, the 
level of certifications. To start with the AZ 900, so if you, if, if, uh, you are a beginner to Microsoft Cloud, we recommend to start with the AZ 900 because it, this course is giving you the fundamental knowledge on the cloud's concepts. It will help you to understand the core Azure services. It will help you to understand how to create and manage the services. So this is a one day course, which is uh, aligned with the Microsoft Learn modules. If you go to the Microsoft Learn website, you can see the fundamentals learning path that covers different modules in this az 900 course it is primarily containing three learning path or three modules one is the cloud concepts second one is the azure architect and services architecture and services and the third one is the Azure management and governance. In the cloud concepts, it talks about what is cloud, what is the benefit, what are the different cloud types, the cloud service models. Such basic functionalities or basic concepts are covered in the first module. But coming to the second module, it will introduce it will introduce the uh, set of services on Azure. Comes under the compute category, network category, storage category, database. There are different uh, categories of services we have. Because Azure is offering more than 200 services. So you can see the core services list is not going to list or it, it's not going to give you an idea about all services but yes you can understand the core services and in the module 3 we talks about the management and governance of azure services so how to manage the azure services using portal what is the post management? Then governance and compliance. How to manage that will be discussed in the module three. So if you are planning to appear for the exam, understand these from these three modules you can see this is the course weight uh, sorry uh, the, the weightage for the scores so around 25 to 30 percentage of the questions will come from the module one 35 to 40 percentage of the questions can come from the second module and 30 to 35 percent of the questions can come from the module three. So this is the weightage for the questions per module. So you can go through the Microsoft Learn modules and all these Microsoft Learn modules give you the conceptual understanding of the services and also some of the modules gives you a sandboxed environment for doing this labs suppose if you have some labs required they are providing a sandboxed environment where you can try the uh, labs 
but you have to have a Azure subscription with you because if you have to create and consume these services, you should have a, a free Azure subscription. You can create it with your credit card. Or if you are a, a student, you can apply for a free student uh, subscriptions offered by Microsoft. So in this uh, session, we are going to discuss some of the core Azure services. So let's start with the first module. As I have mentioned, the first module is giving you understanding about the basic cloud concepts. And here we are going to discuss about the cloud computing. It's a types. And how we can. Use this cloud features or cloud functionalities to build and deploy our applications. So starting with. What is cloud computing? Because that is a fundamental question we have. So what is cloud? If you are a beginner, if you are new to the cloud computing, you should understand how the cloud computing is different from the traditional computing environment. So usually in organizations, they have on-premise servers means they have their file servers, web servers, database servers located in their organization premise, which can be a physical servers or the virtual machines running in on top of physical servers. The entire infrastructure that is the compute, that is management of the machines network, security, backup and disaster recovery, all will be configured and managed by the IT administrator of that company. So it is his responsibility to create and manage this uh, infrastructure. But now organizations don't want to spend much amount on the physical servers, and also they don't want to spend time in creating and managing the resources. Because now the technology is growing faster. So today if I am purchasing one physical server. Tomorrow I may require some different infrastructure, maybe a more powerful computer. So in such cases. If you spend money on or if you invest money on buying servers will go waste. And it also require. Manual effort to create and configure these servers. To avoid this organizations prefer to use cloud computing. So what is this cloud computing? There are cloud vendors. There are organizations like Microsoft, AWS, that is Amazon or Google. They provide the complete infrastructure as a service or the pre configured services as a service. You can access these services over internet. You just need to open your browser, connect to that cloud computing environment, and you can create, delete, update, deploy, or do any kind of other management activities over internet. 
you don't need to worry about creation and management of these servers all will be taken care by the cloud service providers like microsoft and amazon or google as a end user you just need to consume the services provided by this cloud service providers for example if you want to build and deploy an application you don't need to purchase any physical servers you can just create a vm using your cloud subscription and upload your code to that virtual machines the virtual machine is created and managed under physical servers these physical servers will be managed by the cloud service providers so there are hundreds of services provided by these cloud service providers so based on the use case and their category we can classify them as compute storage networking ai database integration services container services and so on there are many categories you can see some of the services comes in the compute category some of the services comes in the networking category some of the services comes in storage category and like this there are different uh, categories of services they offer the benefit of using the cloud services you just need to create the service by choosing the option so whatever type of machine or whatever type of compute you need just to select from the user interface click on the create button it will be created for you so that means you don't need to create explicitly or manage explicitly this servers and it also provides scaling suppose if you need more number of servers or you need a higher configuration of machines you can easily get it from the cloud service there is a concept called shared responsibility model to understand this shared responsibility model we need to first understand the cloud models like uh, infrastructure as a service platform as a service and a software as a service so in an on premises environment the entire infrastructure is created and managed by the administrator the organization so it is their responsibility to manage the entire co configurations and settings if you look into the list of responsibilities starting from the bottom managing the physical data center managing the physical network managing the physical host managing the operating system managing the network controls managing applications and identity uh, of your services then accounts and identities device management and information and data so the entire things will be managed by the customer customer in the sense the administrator of that organization so you can see for on premises all boxes are in blue color which means this is managed by the customer customer in the sense the administrator so it is his responsibility to manage the physical data centers configure the network configuring the host machines 
installing the operating systems, configuring the network controls, installing and configuring the application and security services, everything he has to do. But when it comes to infrastructure as a service, that is IaaS, you can see the three core services like uh, managing the data center, managing the network, and managing the host machines. This will be taken care by the Microsoft, that is the cloud service provider. You can see the color for these boxes are different which means it is managed by Microsoft. And you are responsible to install the operating system, configure the security, deploy the applications, configure the authentication and authorization for the applications, and managing the data. So all will be your responsibility. But the underlying hardware, physical servers or physical systems will be managed by Microsoft. But when it comes to PaaS, that is platform as a service, you will be getting all the features of infrastructure as a service. Means you don't need to manage the data center, you don't need to manage the network, you don't need to manage the host, same as infrastructure as a service. Plus, you don't need to manage the operating system, means the underlying operating system for the VMs, you don't need to manage. The network access, application deployment, then identity and directory infrastructure means authentication configuration will be a shared responsibility. It means some of the network configurations Microsoft will do, some network configurations you can do. That means it's a shared responsibility. That's why you can see the box with the two different colors. But if you see, the customer is responsible to create accounts using or configuring the devices and the data. When it comes to SaaS, that is software as a service, it is the responsibility of Microsoft to manage the physical environment, that is the host, network, and data center, then operating system, network control, and the application deployment. Everything will be taken care of by Microsoft. As a user, the identity and directory infrastructure is a shared responsibility, which means, yes, some configurations will be taken care of by Microsoft, and something will be uh, taken care by the end customer. And the account creation, user account creation, device registration, and information and data management is the responsibility of customer. So this is the shared responsibility model. So when we talk about the cloud, we, sh we should understand the types of clouds. First of all, we have private cloud. So what is private cloud? In private cloud, the organizations uh, create the cloud environment within their data center. That is the on-premise environment, you can say. So you have a data center. Within the data center, you are managing the entire services. So in this scenario, the organization is responsible for managing the entire services because all the services are running from the on-premise servers. But the better uh, feature of this is it is highly secure because it, it does not give access to outside users because you, all your applications and services are deployed in on-premise servers and the external users are not allowed to access it. Only the organizations 
users are allowed to manage this systems but it, when it comes to public cloud so public cloud is another type of cloud where the entire infrastructure is managed by the cloud service providers like microsoft aws and google but yes as a user you can connect to this cloud services create and configure the service instances so over the internet you can access these services provided by cloud service provider so your cloud service providers are offering different types of services maybe a database service or maybe a networking service or maybe some uh, container service so whatever type of service you want you can consume these services over the internet you can configure the access to the services that you have created and you need to authenticate first to create and manage the services suppose if i have to uh, create some virtual machines in the azure cloud first of all i have to create an account in the azure and then log in using those credentials and then only we will be able to create and manage the resources but in hybrid cloud scenarios we will be using the combination of public and private cloud because you must be aware some of the organizations are uh, maintaining their data in a highly secured manner they don't want to uh, put the data in the public cloud because the data may contain some sensitive data and they don't want this data to go into the public cloud so the data can remain in uh, the data can remain in the on premise servers but the applications can run from a public cloud so your application suppose if it is a web application the web application will run from a cl uh, public cloud but it's a data that means if you if it is connecting to a database that database will be located in the on premise environment so we can use a combination of the public cloud services and private cloud so that is called a hybrid cloud so there are different ways to connect the private cloud and public cloud together okay so when you go into associate level certifications or the specialty certifications like networking uh, services you will learn about the different approaches for connecting to the private cloud and pub public cloud means implementing the hybrid cloud solutions so here in public cloud there is no capital expenditure to scale up means you don't need to spend anything on infrastructure because the cloud service providers will have pool of services as a user you just need to create the resource that also any number of resources if you need a if you need a 100 uh, servers you can easily create this 100 servers in cloud okay. there is no infrastructure cost that means you don't need to pay anything on the physical infrastructure the applications can be quickly provisioned and deprovisioned so anytime you can deploy the applications and undeploy the applications organizations pay only for what they use so the the better part of the public cloud is if you are consuming a service if you have created and consuming the services you need to pay only for that services you don't need to pay unnecessarily for other services so what you are consuming 
you have to pay only for that but in private cloud the hardware must be purchased for startup and maintenance so you are responsible to uh, purchase and configure the hardware organizations have complete control over resources and security that means the benefit of using private cloud is because it is completely managed by the organization they have full control they have full control over the environment organizations are responsible for hardware maintenance and update but yes the challenging part is if because the organization is creating and managing the infrastructure it is their responsibility to manage the updates suppose if there is a database update or software update or if you have to take a backup all you have to do manually okay there is no automation you have to manually do all the updation patching backup all will be done manually hybrid cloud means it is giving you the flexibility because for some services you will be leveraging the features of public cloud and for whenever it comes to control and security you will be going with the private cloud so you can combine both the features in hybrid cloud and organizations determine where to run their application so they can decide whether to run our applications in on premise means in private cloud or in the public cloud organizations control security complaints and legal requirements so that like a private cloud the organizations are managing the security compliance and the legal requirements so comparing the capex and opex that is capital expenditure and operational expenditure so capital expenditure means the upfront spending of money on physical infrastructure like as i have discussed if you are planning to go with private cloud it is your responsibility to create and manage the servers so you have to spend money for buying the servers installing and configuring the servers configuring the networking all will be done by you so you have to spend a lot of money for that cost from capital expenditure have a value that reduces over time so we know that if you spend a money on uh, a device it's a cost or it's a value will be decreased over time it's like anything even if you purchase a car or a bike or any other device, uh object it's a value will be reduced right so like in case of uh, in the name of depreciation okay or some other way so the value will be reduced operational expenditure means you spend on products and services as needed that is pay as you go so you need to spend the amount for the uh, software and services that you are consuming so you can go with the pay as you go model so that means how much you are consuming based on that you have to pay suppose if you are consuming a particular service or you are uh, creating and managing a particular Uh, software so you have to pay only for that so how long you are consuming you need to pay for that like licenses suppose if you are 
purchasing a license for database servers. This database server license, what is the cost you have to pay immediately and then you can start consuming. So you are planning to use it for an year. So you can buy the license for one year. Consumption based model is an important feature of cloud. Because this cloud service providers use the consumption based model to charge from the customer. So when the customer start using the services, they need to pay only for the resources that they are using. That also how long they are using the services, they have to pay only that. So what is the benefit? of consumption based model because it is first of all cheaper secondly you can do a cost prediction so how the cost prediction can be done because different cloud services follows different costing or different billing method suppose in case of virtual machines virtual machines cost is calculated based on the compute and storage. So what is the compute you are using? That means what, is, what type of machine you are using, which operating system you are using, and what kind of storage you are using. So based on that, the cost is calculated. So you can uh, plan. Yes, I am planning to, or I am planning to use this virtual machine for 10 hours. So what can be the cost? I can go to the Microsoft uh, uh, cost calculator and then select the type of machine which you are planning to use and what is the duration. So it will give you uh, the estimated cost. Okay, suppose if you are using or you are planning to use a D4S V3 machine for 10 hours. So for 10 hours, this particular machine uh, charges a particular amount so that will be given to you so you can do post prediction for every service because per second or per minute or per hour what is the cost that is already defined so according to your location the type of service and the usage the cost can be different so you can easily predict what will be the cost prices for individual resources and services are provided so as i have mentioned for different cloud services different costing models we can use some of them are you following the provisioned compute model some of them are serverless model in the provisioned compute model itself there is a uh, costing approach that once you create a service it will start charging once you create a service it will start charging and if you are planning to use it for five hours you just need to multiply the uh, unit of cost into five suppose if it is one hour cost is 10 rupees then for five hour it is five into 10 50 rupees so you can easily calculate or if it is uh, uh, per minute costing, suppose I am using it for uh, 10 minutes. So what is the cost for 10 minutes? You can easily calculate. Here the billing is happening based on the actual usage. So if, uh, if you go to the Azure portal, you will be able to see the cost of each and every service based on the pricing tier that you select but the the pricing is displayed for a month like suppose if you go to the virtual machines section in virtual machine if you select a type of particular type of virtual machine it will show you the cost is 5000 or a cost is 7500 okay something like that so it means you are 
if you are if you are using this machine for a complete month then it will charge you 5000 or 7500 whatever it is okay but if you are using it for just one day then you have to pay for the cost for that one day and you don't need to pay 5000 okay so it depends on what is the duration you are consuming the resource that is for the actual usage you need to pay like a uh, electricity so how many units you are you have consumed the electricity the same uh, way we can calculate this also suppose if you are consuming uh, 100 unit then you have to pay for 100 unit if you are consuming 150 unit then you have to pay for 150 unit there is a predefined cost cloud benefits so far we have discussed the fundamentals of cloud computing like uh, what is cloud and what are the different uh, types of cloud and then we have discussed the benefits uh, of each and every cloud model like if you use private cloud what is it if you use public cloud what is it so we have discussed now the overall cloud benefits so these points give you a clear understanding about the features of cloud computing cloud is offering high availability simply we call it as ha so ha means high availability that means if you want your service to be executed or consumed by customers without any interruption that means 24 by 7 you have to run your applications and services without any interruption your cloud service is capable to provide high availability because in case if one server goes down it can continue serving your request from another server depends on what kind of cloud service uh, model you select like in infrastructure as a service or platform as a service you can configure the high availability suppose in case of platform as a service models you don't need to uh, 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 configure the high availability scenarios explicitly because it is by default available you just need to enable that feature but in case of infrastructure as a service you can configure you can configure the high availability by uh, creating additional servers suppose if i can if i want to run my application from uh, virtual machines i can create more than one virtual machines and put them behind a load balancer so if one server goes down it will automatically starts serving from the other one or it will load balanced to the other server so this way high availability is achieved in the cloud then elasticity so you can increase or decrease the capacity and the number of servers according to your requirement so based on the demand you can uh, what stretch your services availability so if you need a more number of servers you can do that or if there is no usage for the application you can reduce the number of servers scalability means if you want the servers uh, means if you want multiple servers to 
handle more number of uh, requests or you want to increase the size and capacity of your existing servers without spending or without spending any single minute you will be able to do that because the cloud is providing a pool of servers you can easily increase or decrease the number of servers and the size of servers according to your requirement scalability can be horizontal scaling and vertical scaling horizontal scaling means increasing the number of servers for handling more number of requests vertical scaling means increasing the size of the servers or uh, increasing or decreasing the size of the servers according to the performance suppose if you want to increase the performance of the servers you can upgrade to a higher configuration machine so that is the scalability reliability means how reliable the system is how quickly it is able to recover from the failures suppose if a database goes down how quickly it can recover from that failure so in case of pass services you don't need to do anything it will by default provides the high availability and reliability features because uh, by creating the replicas and uh, enabling the disaster recovery solutions if a uh, service is interrupted it automatically recover from that predictability you can easily calculate the cost of your services and also you can identify which of the services need to be provisioned for handling uh, the the for implementing the solutions security is a configurable uh, service like in the shared re responsibility model we have discussed some of the security implementations are done by microsoft and some security configurations are done by the user so you can say security is a shared responsibility so microsoft is also providing some security configurations and the user is also able to implement his own security configuration so it's a customizable one so we can say it's a shared responsibility of microsoft and the, the customer governance so for deploying your applications in a cloud environment you will be following some kind of guidelines and you manage your services you manage your services to enable the high availability reliability scalability according to the features offered by the cloud so for uh, there are different uh, ser or services that offers governance and compliance like uh, you can implement the azure policies rbac then the advisor okay azure advisor so there are different uh, services that offers the governance and compliance features manageability means who is responsible to manage the uh, cloud services that depends on what kind of uh, cloud service model you select if you are selecting the infrastructure as a service it is a responsibility of the user to manage the entire infrastructure means 
infrastructure in the sense of virtual machines, not the physical systems. But in case of uh, PaaS services, platform as a service models, Microsoft is responsible to manage the infrastructure. And you just need to go and deploy your applications and services in the pre-configured platform. And you don't need to manage the backup, disaster recovery, scalability. It is all maintained by the cloud service provider. But in infrastructure as a service, it is the responsibility of the user to manage all this. Now this cloud service types, we have already discussed about the cloud service types, like uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. So in infrastructure as a service, the cloud service provider is providing you the servers, the physical servers, network, and other storage services. And it is your responsibility to build the environment for deploying your applications. So they are providing the physical environment. And as a user, you can rent the servers, build the virtual machines, configure the network, install the operating systems, and then deploy the applications. So that is called the infrastructure as a service. So the benefit of infrastructure as a service is it will allow you to customize your environment. So you, you have control over the uh, application uh, deployment environment. So you can choose your virtual machine types. You can choose the storage type. You can configure the network according to your policies. All you can customize in the infrastructure as a service solution. But when it comes to PaaS, they are providing a pre-configured environment, which means the underlying operating system, storage, and networking all will be taken care by Microsoft. You are just allowed to deploy your application. So you don't need to go and manage the uh, infra related functionalities that is all in place it's a it's providing a pre-configured environment so you just need to deploy your applications in software as a service even the application is also provided by the cloud service provider. Like uh, Microsoft Office 365, the email applications like uh, Outlook or Hotmail, or the communication systems like uh, Teams, okay, all these are already installed and configured. You just need to consume that services, which means the application is not developed by, developed and deployed by the customer. It is also provided by the cloud service provider, which means the underlying infrastructure, operating system, the deployment tools and services, and even the applications, everything is provided by Microsoft. So that model is called a software as a service model. So now if you if you are planned to build the cloud solutions, you can take a decision whether I have to go and use infrastructure solutions or PaaS solutions or SaaS solutions. So that depends on your scenario. So as a user, if you are interested to create and manage your infrastructure, 
using your own custom configurations, then you can go for infrastructure as a service because that is giving the flexibility of choosing the cloud services, customizing it and configuring it. But in case of PaaS, like if you are a developer, you may not be aware about how to create the virtual machines, how to uh, uh, configure the network, and how to configure the security, all this. So what you can do as a developer, you can focus on the application development. You can focus on the application development, and you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure or underlying uh, operating system. You can start writing the application and deploy inside the pre-created or pre-configured servers as a container, as a Docker containerized application or as a normal code based application. In SaaS model, if you are an end user, you are not a developer, you are not a technical person, you just want to consume certain type of services. For example, I want to use email service, but I don't know how to write a email application, how to create an email application. And also I don't know how to install and configure the email applications. So I don't know any technical things about creating and configuring and installing the applications and services. So we can go ahead with the SaaS solutions, which is providing you the pre-installed application. You just need to subscribe it and start using it. So that's it in the first module. Now, if you have any questions related to the module one, you can put that questions in the chat. I'll be answering your questions. So if you have any questions related to the points we have discussed, Put your questions in the chat or else we'll move to the next module. Okay, I can't see any questions here. So in the first module of AZ900, you have seen the cloud fundamentals, like what is cloud, the type of cloud service model, and the benefits of using the cloud. But yes, so far, we have not discussed anything about the Azure. Because once your base is clear, if you are clear with what is cloud and what are the different uh, cloud models like private, public, and hybrid, and what are the different uh, cloud service models like uh, IAS. SaaS and SaaS, and what are the different features offered by the cloud? Means benefits of using the cloud. If you are clear with this, then we can start focusing on the specific cloud services. So in the next module, 
we are going to discuss about some of the Azure services. But before start using these Azure services, you have to understand some of the core features of Azure. So let's understand that first. In this module, we are going to understand different Azure services. And I'll show you a couple of uh, demos also for this. If you are learning through Microsoft Learn documentations, you can see some sandboxed environment where you can do some hands on if you have a free subscription with you. So let's start with the Azure architectural component. So if you start using the cloud, specifically Azure cloud, it is very, very important to understand what are the different architectural components of Azure. Starting with regions, so what is mean by a region? Because if I am the administrator, I can tell you, okay, can you go and deploy my application into this particular region? So what is mean by a region? So a region, you can say, uh, it's a geographical uh, area, maybe one country or more than one countries together we can call as a region. Okay, sometimes within one country you can see multiple regions. If you look, if you look the uh, Azure is supporting more than 60 regions it's, it's an old number now the number of regions which is supported by azure is a uh, high so because it's keep updating so every day every month you can see there are some updations happening in azure so the number of regions are more and every region contains multiple data centers suppose in india we can say there is Central India, West India, and South India. And each of this region will have a multiple data centers inside it. This data center simply means the buildings or simply the group of buildings where you are physical servers are located. So it's like, a, you can say it's like a housing society where multiple buildings are there, where in each building will have multiple floor, and in each floor there are multiple uh, flats, and in each flat there are multiple rooms. So similarly, so similarly, in regions, we have data center, which means inside the data center, you can see multiple buildings. And inside the buildings, there will be multiple floors. In each floor, you can see multiple racks of servers. So if you go to internet and search for the data center picture, So this, you can say data center, right? So inside this data centers, you will see multiple uh, buildings and each building will have multiple floors. Okay, these are 
data centers. Okay. You can see, so you can search on internet how a data center looks like. So if you see one region inside one region, you will see multiple data centers. And it is helping the developers or helping the users to build and deploy the applications with a low latency. How? Suppose if I am a developer from India, but my customers are from US. So what I can do to reduce the latency for my customers, I can build and deploy my applications in the US region. So we have East US, West US, uh, East US to West, North Central US, South Central US like that. Different uh, US uh, regions available. You can select any location and deploy your application uh, which is close to your customer so that you can reduce the latency for accessing the services. So you can see in the diagram or in the picture, there are multiple data centers across the world. So if you are interested, you can go and deploy your applications and services into specific regions. And it also helps you to uh, preserve the data residency and compliance so how because according to the compliance policies some organizations or some countries will have some restrictions for placing your data outside the uh, country for example just give you an example as per the rba rules the banks are not allowed to put the user's data outside the country so every customer data should be stored within India itself. I'm just giving an example. Okay. So that you can say it's a compliance policy. So inside India, where I will place my data? If I'm if my application, banking applications are running from Azure Cloud, I can this decide where I will deploy my applications. Because according to the policy, it is not allowed to deploy uh, or store the customer data outside India. So in that cases, we can choose any India region and deploy the application. Second is availability zone. The availability zone is an important uh, component or important feature that provides high availability. Because you can say it's a high availability feature offered by Azure Cloud. So what is it? If you look at the regions, suppose if you consider East US or West US or Central India, so that kind of regions when you select, the region will contain multiple data centers. But these data centers are separated into different zones. So why different zones? Because different zones will have different power supply, cooling, and networking. And the benefit is in case if one uh, zone is down, it will never affect the other zone. For example, within a campus or within a compound, there are three buildings. If all the three buildings have same power supply and connection, what, what is the problem? If the power supply is connected, all the three buildings will go down or all the three buildings power supply will go down. But 
if we are implementing three different power sources for three buildings, means building one's power supply is different from building two, building two's power supply is different from building three. So in that cases, even if one building's power supply or network is down, it never affect the other one because they, their power supply and networking source is different. So you can say these buildings are organized in a availability zone basis. So what is the benefit if something happens to the data centers in one zone? So one zone may contain multiple data centers. If the data centers in one zone goes down, it will never affect the other zone. That's the benefit. Region pair. Some selected services like a storage account allow you to deploy your uh, services in multiple regions. Suppose if you are deploying your application in East US. I'm considering the storage example, storage service example. Whenever you deploy your uh, data or whenever you upload your data into East US location, it by default creates three copies of the data. Okay, I'm talking about the storage service example. It creates three copy of the data. So why three copy? Because in case if one copy goes down, still we are able to recover from the other copies. That is the high availability option they provide. And you don't need to explicitly create these three copies. It is automatically creating the three copy. Whenever you upload your data, automatically three copies will be created. But all the three copies are typically stored in the same region, same data center. But the question is, what will happen if something, what will happen if something goes wrong with this region? For example, if you are storing the data in a East US location, and if there is a natural calamity happens, all the three copies will go down, right? Because there are three copies, but all the three copies are in East US. So, to enable high availability, they have come up with an additional option called geo replication. So, geo replication means you will be able to replicate your data to some other regions which will be far from the uh, prime first location. That means at least 300 miles uh, away from the first location. And these regions are called paired regions. So what is meant by pair? If I create something in the first region and enable the geo replication, it will automatically re replicate or automatically copy that data to the paired region. So what is the benefit? In case if the primary region is down, primary region is completely destroyed, no problem, still you are able to recover your data. For every region in Azure, there is a paired regions assigned. So you don't need to assign. It's already assigned by Microsoft. You can see the list in the top, uh, right side, like in for North Central US, South Central US is the paired region and vice versa. For East US, West US is the paired region. That means for West US, East US is the paired one. Like this for each region there is a pair 
so look you can see at the bottom there is south india india south and india central so for south india central india is the paid one which means if you create anything in central india it can be replicated to south india or if something is created in south india it can be replicated to central india the azure sovereign regions the us government services so if you see there are some selected regions which is only assigned for selected organizations like a uh, us government so azure us government means you are not allowed to create anything in that regions because that region is specifically designed for government okay so if you see uh, uh, us government where they have separate azure services separate azure instances which is completely uh, isolated from the known us government deployments means only government applications and services will be running from there is not for the public accessible only to screened authorized personnel so only uh, authorized people are allowed to go inside that data centers similarly there are some selected locations like china you can see azure china is the first foreign public cloud service provider uh, in compliance with the government regulations because according to china rules chinese rules their data should not go outside even if their uh, customers sorry even if their public data suppose if their customers or if their uh, uh, the organizations wants to deploy the applications and services it should be within china they they are not allowed to deploy anything outside the china so such cases they are they have created regions specifically for china where public cloud is not allowed to deploy anything and only chinese applications and services will be running from there it's a physically separated instance of azure cloud service operated by 21 via net that means it is operated by microsoft but through a different uh, vendor but why they have done because they want all the data of their customers stays within the china region only so i can show you the azure portal so that you can see the different regions list for different services so let's go to azure portal you must have some valid subscription with you so i already have a valid subscription which is associated with my mct so i have logged in with the credentials so here you can see i i have recently created lots of services here and here you can see the subscription so i have a subscription here which is msdn platforms that is my mct subscription and you will be and you will be able to uh, create different types of services so to see the 
complete list of services, you can click on this menu icon. And here you can click on this all services. Some of the service category you can see, but to see all the services, click on all services in the left side, you can see the categories. See this, these are the categories of services we have. We have AI, machine learning, analytics, compute, containers, databases, DevOps, then identity, integration, IoT, networking, security, storage, and so on. So there are different, different services. Suppose if I want to use storage solutions, I can select storage. So you can see all the storage services that comes under this. And they, they have again categorized here. So you if I have to go and create a storage account. So here you can see I'll select storage account. You can see I already have two storage accounts, but I'm going to create a third one. So here I can select my subscription and resource group. So resource group is just to group related resources. Suppose logically you want to group multiple resources, then you can go for a resource group. So here I'm giving my group name as test group. And name of the storage accounts so you can specify here so you can see it's a simple uh, user interface very easily anybody can create resources without any further training right so you can specify the storage account name you can click on this to understand what are the conditions the name must be unique across all existing storage account names in azure it must be 3 to 24 characters long and can contain only lowercase letters and numbers. So only lowercase case letters and numbers, minimum 3 character, maximum 24 character. So I can give a name. I have given this name synergetic store and I can select a region here so you can see the available regions and their geography this is Africa Asia Pacific Asia Pacific itself is multiple regions East Asia Central India Australia East and many many other then Europe is there Middle East, US, and so on. I'm going with the Central India. See, I'm selecting Central India, which is uh, Pune. I'm selecting that. Performance of the storage account is standard. It's OK. Here is the important redundancy. If you select geo redundant storage, what happens? It is going to fail over to a secondary region whenever there is uh, when there is a disaster disaster happens in the primary region. So, which is the primary region here? Central India. I have selected Central India here, right? So, I'm selecting GRS. So, it automatically selected the paired region. So, paired region is for Central India. It is South India. I'm just creating a resource.
this may take a minute to create let's wait for this to complete Yes, you can see it's now created. And if you go into the overview page, you can see the location of this storage account is Central India. But you can see there is another region which is selected. Here you can see primary and secondary. Primary is Central India and secondary one is automatically selected that is south india i have not selected south india anywhere right but it is automatically selected south india as the paired region so that's why in the list we have seen for central india south india is the paired region So that is about the global uh, infrastructure of Azure, like what is region, what is availability zone, what is a data center, and the paired regions. So now going ahead, we will discuss some of the Azure services and its uh, components. But before that, let's take a quick break of. 10 minutes and then we will continue so we can take a break of uh, 10 15 minutes and after that i will continue with the core azure services and its components so now you can go and have a cup of tea or coffee and then we'll continue after the break.
Hello everyone. I hope all are back. <clears throat> okay, we'll start now. So we have discussed about the Azure infrastructure that is uh, regions, the availability zones, data centers, and the paired regions. Now let's focus on some of the Azure services. So what is mean by the word is a resource. A resource simply means an instance of a service type. So there are different service types available like a virtual machine, storage account, virtual network, app service, database, and many other services we have. If you are creating an instance of a particular service, I can say that is a resource. If you remember, before the break, I have created a storage account. So that storage account I have created with the name Synergetics Store, something like that. So this is a resource. This is which type of resource? It's a storage account type of resource. It is primarily used to store different types of data, including the files, unstructured files, messages, and NoSQL key value pair data. So there are different types of services we can store, but ultimately this is a storage service. So the instance of the storage account, which I have created with the name Synergetic Store is a resource. So that is, what mean by a resource? A resource can be a compute resource, storage resource, database resource, network resource, or some other. Because we have different types of resources or different types of services. A resource group is another important term that we have to understand because in Azure, any resource you create, it should be inside a resource group. So then what is a what is a resource group? That's a question. A resource group is a logical container. Just like a folder in our machines. Suppose inside your machines, you are keeping lots of video files, images, and audio files. But for keeping all the video, image, and audio files, you first create a folder. Maybe its name will be media files. So the name of the folder is media. And then you put all the media files inside it, like video, audio, images, etc. Suppose if you have some office documents, like Word, Excel, PowerPoint, and other reports, so you can create another folder called office documents and then put all the files inside it. So why you have created that folder? For grouping all the related data. So you don't want to mix your media files like audio, video, uh, images with your office documents. So to avoid that confusion, to avoid that uh, uh, grouping of resources, means mixing of resources, you have created two different folders 
and given a name for that folder and put the relevant files inside it, right? So inside the office documents, you are putting all the office related documents. If uh, you have media files, you can create a folder called media and then put all the audio, video images inside it. So what is what we have done is the related informations we are grouping, right? So the entertainment media files we put in one folder, office documents we put in a different folder, right? So similarly, in Azure also, we will be creating different resources for different projects. For example, if I am working in an organization and my company is serving for different customers. Suppose if I am part of two projects, one for the customer X and another for, for customer Y. But for both the customers, we are creating some uh, web applications, databases, storage, etc. But if I create everything in one group or one folder, it will be confusing because later it will be confusing because I will, I will not be able to recognize which one is for customer X and which one is for customer Y. So better what we can do, we can create separate groups for customer X and customer Y. So we can create a customer X group and all the VM storage databases I can put inside the customer X group. And for customer Y, I can create a separate group and all the resources Later to customer Y, I can put into the customer Y group. So that's why I'm saying it is a container. And why I'm saying it's a logical container? Because yes, while creating a resource group, we will be specifying a location, a region. But inside that container, I can create multiple other resources, like uh, I can create a VM, storage, database many services you can create, but they can be from different regions. For example, here you can see these are the different resource groups I have. You can see these are the different resource groups I have. I have given the OAI group, test group, work group, like this, different, different groups I have. Suppose this group location where this group is created, this group is created in Southeast Asia, that is Singapore. Okay. So inside this, I have a storage account, but you can see the storage account is created in West India. Okay. That means my group, logical group is created in Southeast Asia. But inside that group, you can see inside the work group, I have only one item that is a storage account. That storage account is created in which location? West India. So that means it is not mandatory that the resource group and the resource must be in same location. It can be in different location also. Okay. And every resource belongs to a particular group. So this belongs to work group. Suppose if I go to test group, there is another resource storage account that belongs to test group. In OAI group, that is open AI group, you can see this is an open AI resource. Here you can see the type of the resource. It's an open AI resource. It is created in Sweden Central. Okay, but my but my resource group East in, is in the East US location. Okay, so that's why I'm saying it's a logical container because it's not physically grouping, it's just logically grouping. The resources can exist in what, only one resource group, means one resource will belongs to one group only. But inside one resource group, there can be multiple resources. Okay, means in one group, there can be 100 hundreds of resources no problem resources can exist in different regions means yes your resource can be from east us west us south central us uh, sweden central southeast asia east asia any location but 
it can be placed in a single resource group. Resources can be moved to different resource groups. Suppose from one group, if I want to move the resource to another group, it is possible. So what do you have to do? Just select the resource group. Suppose if I have to move my storage account. See, this is the storage account which I have to move. It is currently belongs to which group? Test group. If I have to move this to another group like OAI group or work group, I can select from these three dots. Here there is an option for move. Right? So you can see when I click on these three dots, there is an option menu comes from the menu. I can select move and then we have option for move to another resource group, move to another subscription, move to another region. So there are moving options available. Yeah. Applications can utilize multiple resource groups which means inside your application, you may have multiple type of resource group. For example, if you create a web application that is connecting to SQL database. So your SQL database is one resource. Web application is a different resource. Web, web app is a different resource. So web app you can put in one resource group and storage you can put in, uh, sorry, database you can put in different group it is possible no problem because it's obviously a logical container okay so you can put your resources in different different regions it's not a problem next we have to understand what is a subscription see Microsoft or any other cloud service provider, they are providing these services not for free. Because they have spent millions on millions of amount for creating this infrastructure. They have created the data centers. Inside the data centers, they have physical servers, network devices, and they are paying for electricity and many other things right so they are running these services not for free so as a user if you want to consume these services first you have to subscribe it like how you are subscribing the hotstar or amazon prime or uh, the z tv or some other movie channels so netflix you are subscribing what it means you are subscribing for a period of time Right, so it's a one month subscription or one year subscription. So once you have subscribed, you will be able to watch all the movies, serials, and other documentaries in which is coming in that uh, channel. Right, suppose if you are subscribing to Hotstar, Disney Hotstar, yes, you are allowed to watch the movies, you are allowed to watch the uh, TV serials or you are allowed to watch the sports, right? So all you can watch. Similarly, if you have to uh, use the cloud services, you have to buy a subscription. But here the subscription is an agreement between you and the customer, uh, sorry, you and Microsoft, which means you will be saying, okay, I want to use the Microsoft services for one year, then I can call it as it's a one year subscription. Or I can say, yes, I want to use it for one month. Then I can say it's a one month subscription. And inside the agreement, they will be saying, okay, I will be uh, paying you this much amount for one month or I'm purchasing this subscription. And Microsoft will give you a guarantee, yes, you are allowed to create these many services with this subscription and we will charge you based on your usage yes we have created a agreement that agreement is called a subscription 
according to the agreement there is no charges for creating this subscription or agreement but depends on the usage they you will be charged suppose if it is a pay as you go subscription there are different type of subscriptions but if it is a pay as you go subscription there is no initial charges you can create a subscription and you will be agreeing with microsoft that okay i will consume some services and based on my consumption you can give me a monthly bill like electricity bill so if you are not consuming the electricity there is no amount but if you are consuming the electricity then they will charge you okay you have used the 100 units or 125 units so and this is the cost right so similarly they will be charging from you and microsoft is giving you an agreement saying you can create your services in this particular pricing models and we will give you a high availability that is sla service level agreement which means if you create the resources using this pricing model we will give you high availability of 99.99 percentage which means it never goes down we will make sure that it is accessible every time it never goes down okay even if it is going for going down in a year not more than 5 minutes 10 minutes depends on the type of sla okay so that is the agreement or that is a guarantee microsoft is giving to its customers and according to that you have to pay also okay because they are providing the service so you have to pay for that right so the subscription is acting as a billing boundary because it clearly defines what are the services you can consume and what will be the charges access control boundary means you can define uh, the users and their permissions on subscription level so that you can decide who who all are can use it for example if you purchase a, a hotstar subscription or amazon prime subscription or netflix subscription there is an always a restriction that okay you can use it in maximum three devices or maximum four devices that also uh, two large tvs and two mobile devices so there are some restrictions like uh, okay it can be used only in this way only these many users can use it so the, everywhere they are applying some restrictions similarly here also you can configure the access policies like uh, yes i am the owner of the subscription so i have full access but my colleague he is working under me so i am giving him only the read permission which means whatever services i am creating he can see that resources but he cannot create he cannot delete he can see the resources or he can consume he can use that but he cannot delete he cannot create so he don't have the creation and deletion permission so i have defined some permissions on this subscription so i'll say i have a production subscription in the production subscription only i am the administrator and all the other users are under me so that i have the full control whatever i want i can create and delete and update but others will have a limited permissions okay so that is access control boundary so you can define the permissions on the subscription level management groups that is another important thing which administrators need to understand because if you are running an it organization you will be dealing with the different customers different clients for every client i cannot go and use a single subscription because i said depends on the subscription the features will be different posting model will be different right so in that case suppose if i am running an it company 
and uh, Wipro is my client, Infosys is my client, Hexaware is my client, Oracle is my client. So for all these four customers, I cannot use a single subscription because I am putting all the uh, Oracle resources inside my subscription. I'm deploying all the Hexaware resources in my subscription. I'm deploying all the resources required for Wipro and Infosys into the subscription. So then it will be difficult for me to control the access because for Wipro people, I have to give only this access. For uh, uh, Infosys people, I have to give only this access. So managing that will be difficult. So organizations usually maintain multiple subscriptions. Like if I am running the company, I will create one subscription for uh, Infosys, one subscription for Wipro, one subscription for uh, Hexaware and one subscription for Oracle. So that means I have four subscriptions that are for different, different clients. Maybe for one client itself, multiple subscription will be there. Yes, uh, Wipro is my client. So for Wipro, I have two or three subscriptions because for Wipro, I have two production subscriptions where I can deploy my production level applications and there can be multiple dev subscriptions. Dev subscription means it is also subscription only, but it is mainly used for dev and test scenarios for trying out all the uh, uh, what, what experiments so I can do in that subscription. So I don't want my POCs to go with the production subscription because in production subscription, we will deploy the completed applications. We don't do any kind of POCs inside the production, right? So for that, we can create a different subscriptions. So now if, if as a customer, sorry, as a Microsoft Azure user, if I have multiple subscriptions, applying different conditions, policies, it will be difficult for me. So we can group them under management group. So I can say I'm creating a Wipro management group and inside the Wipro management group, there are two subscriptions, one production and one dev subscription. And there is Infosys management group. Infosys management group, there are five subscriptions because they have more number of projects, right? So that means for different companies, I ha they have multiple subscriptions. For grouping the subscriptions, I will use the management groups. So I can show you that subscription in my account where it is coming and what is the management groups used for that. So whenever you create an Azure account, there is an active directory or now it's called a Microsoft Entra. So Microsoft Entra is created which is an identity service and your subscription is associated with an uh, AD tenant or Entra tenant. Okay. There can be multiple subscriptions for a single user and you can put these subscriptions in different management groups. There is a default management groups created. Suppose if you want to see the list of active directories I have, I can show you, you can see here, these are the directories. This is my default directory. This is the one which I own. And these are the other active directories, which I am a member. So this is owned by my company, but I am a member of that. Okay, but this is my own active directory. Okay, and my subscription belongs to this active directory. You can see, it's an ID, the directory ID is FC73 something. So that means this is my Active Directory ID. If I go to subscriptions, you can see I have only one subscription which is in the active mode. Okay, I have one subscription in the active mode. I have multiple other subscription, but they are currently inactive so if i select this you can see they are disabled because it was a 
one month subscription and it is expired. OK, so this two is already expired, so that's why they are coming here as disabled. So one user or one account or one sub, uh, active directory can have a multiple subscriptions. You can see this three subscriptions comes under which active directory? Default directory. I have already showed you the directory. So inside that directory, there are multiple subscriptions. And this is the only one which is currently active. OK. And you can see here, this belongs to which management group? These are in the tenant root group, which is the default one. But this I have placed in a separate group. To see that, I can go for management groups. If you look, you can see here I have three subscriptions. I have three subscriptions, which is in the tenant root group level. So this this is all expired. So Azure Pass sponsorship, there are three, but these three are coming under the root group. This is the default group. But I have created some subgroups. You can see under that root group, I have created two additional groups. One is MCT resources. Inside that, I have my MSDN platform subscription. The next one is training group, but I don't have anything there. But if I have to move one of this to there, it's possible. But currently, this is disabled. But let's try. OK, I'll move this. I can move this to training group. Yeah, this is failed because this is actually a disabled subscription. So it's not possible. So it is possible to move if it is an active subscription. You can see these are in root group. So this I can move from one to another like this. I have to select what where I have to move. I have to move to this. This way we can move it. This is now moved, I think. Yes, so the first one is actually removed, I think. That's why it is not able to move. Here you can see it is moved, and this is here. This also, if I have to move, You can see it's now moved. So in the default route, default management group, I have one subscription. There are two subgroups I have created. MCT group, there is one subscription. And this is training group, there is two subscriptions. So you can consider this is my Wipro subscription and this is Infosys subscription. So inside the Infosys, multiple subscriptions. Right. So like this, you can organize the resources. OK, that's a. OK, so here you can see how we can create a resource. I'll show you uh, creating a virtual machine and connecting to the virtual machine inside a resource group. So how to create a resource inside the resource group. So we have already created one that is a storage account, but let me show you how I can create a virtual machine. So I have a resource group, so don't confuse. There is a resource group and management management group. Management group is for managing the subscriptions. A resource group is for managing the resources, means grouping the resources. Here, inside the test group, I have a storage service. 
but I can create a new resource inside this group. So I'll click on this create and then choose virtual machine or else I can go to the creator resource and then select a virtual machine. So here while creating the VM, I can choose my subscription. So this a resource need to be created under which subscription. So I have only one active subscription that is MSDN platform. So I'm selecting that. Then a resource group. So this VM which I'm going to create needs to be part of test group. So I'm selecting test group. What should be the name of the resource? I can provide a name, maybe VM1. Any name you can provide, not an issue. Region, so where you want to create this resource. So by default, Central India is coming. If you want to change the location, you can change it. Let it be Central India. And availability option, so you can see, uh, we can deploy the resources in different, different availability zone. So this is the first VM I am creating. So I can create this in the availability zone zone one so there are three zones so i can say okay i want to create this vm in zone one or zone two you can see it's automatically increase the names like a vm11 vm12 and vm13 because i have selected three zones so it will automatically create three copies of that same vm but if i want to create only one then i can simply use this okay so this is going to be creating only one VM. Okay. If I select multiple zones, then multiple VMs will be created. Two VMs will be created. Um, I, I need only one for a demo purpose. Then security type. So Microsoft already configured some security policies, which is very strict. Okay. So if you apply the trusted launch VMs, then it will allow you to connect only from the uh, Microsoft environments. So I want a standard VM which will give you a basic level of security. Okay, I don't want very advanced uh, security configurations. So I'll go with the standard level of security. And what is the image means which operating system I want to use for this. So I'll go with Windows 10 or I can go with Windows Server. So I'll go with Windows Server. So I, I can show you one thing. So I'll select Windows Server because I want to deploy a web application. So Windows Server is selected. VM architecture is x64. Spot instance not required. VM size. VM size means what is the CPU and RAM required for running these applications. So you can select different VM sizes. So see all sizes. So you can see the different size VMs are there. E series, D series, N series, L series, F series. So you can see the capacity of the VMs are different and the cost is given in the last column. So I will go with a low cost one. That is this one. This is two CPU with the 8 GB RAM. This is enough for our demo purpose. This is enough. I'm selecting that. Now for connecting to this VM, I can use the username password. Now we can select the inbound ports for connecting to the VM. So if I have to enable web applications for connecting the web applications, HTTP port number I can enable. For RDP, I'm enabling RDP port number. Then I'll go with disk. Disk is, I think I can go with the standard SSD. 
no additional disk is required next so vm need to be created inside a network so the network configuration will come as it is i don't want to customize it i'll just go with default so all i'll go with the default policies let's create the vm so here you can see per hour 5 rupees that means if i if i am running this machine for one complete hour 60 minutes it will be charging me 5 rupees 5.1874 indian rupees so that means if i am deleting this after one hour it will be charging 5 rupees only monthly cost is 3000 something which was showing This may take a minute to create the resource. Let's wait for that. Okay, you can see the VM is created. I'm just going to the resource. So here you can see VM is the resource which was which is created, and I can connect to the VM. So I'll go to connect, download the RDP file. Yes, you can see this is the virtual machines environment. It's a Windows Server 2022 virtual machine. This is the first time setup. This is the first time it's loading. Yep. So currently, this machine is a very simple, normal uh, Windows Server machine. Nothing is installed inside it. But if I have to convert this into a uh, web server, which uh, in which I can access the web applications using this public IP. So this is the public IP of this VM. So if I go to this public IP, you can see there is nothing. If there is nothing loading because there is no websites deployed in this. Or you can, instead of using this IP, it is also possible to use the uh, domain name. So for that, for the uh, IP, you have to assign the domain name. So here the DNS label you have to specify. For example, 
I am seeing Synergetics VM1. So Syn VM1 is the domain name I am assigning. Let's save this. So this is the IP address of this machine one. So it's, it will be synvm onecentralindiacloudappazurecom So that's a domain name. So if I go back to this VM, now you can see here the DNS name is appearing. So the, either I can use this IP or I can use this DNS name. If I go to this and selecting this, this, you can see it is not loading any page because there is no web applications running from that server. OK, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to install IIS and just run a simple web app from there. A sample page I will run from here. So this is my VM and I'm what I'm going to do. I'll open this server manager. And install the IIS. This is the web server. This may take a minute to install the web server. Once it is completed, we will go back and check. Okay, so this is done. Now what I'm going to do, I'll just go back to my host machine. So here, I'll just uh, refresh. See, now you can see I'm able to access the web server page, which is running inside this VM. The same, I can access it using the domain name also. You can see, same, I can access using the domain name or IP. So IP or domain name, both I can use for accessing this. Okay, so this is how we create the virtual machines and deploy the applications. Okay, so now we have seen how the uh, re VM resource is created and how to use it for deploying the web application so i have not deployed any custom web application but yes you have seen uh, there is a default web page is loaded now let's move to the next compute and networking so this is one of the core service in Azure because compute is required to run your applications. Like just now, we have seen the VM. 
while creating the vm we can configure the operating system type we can configure the network we can configure the ip we can configure the disk storage everything so because it's an infrastructure as a service we have control i have control over the vm size vm configuration vm networking right So the compute services, so what is mean by compute services? So compute services are typically used to run your applications. So Azure Compute is an on-demand computing service that provides computing resources such as disk, processors, memory, networking, and operating systems so that you will be able to deploy your applications inside it. For example, virtual machines. So we have already seen a virtual machine, how to create a virtual machine, how to uh, enable web server, and how to deploy the application. So we have seen all these just now. App service. So app service is another compute service which provides pre-configured environment. That is a pass environment. What is mean by pass environment? Because it is providing you the pre-configured environment for deploying your web applications. Container instances. It is actually a serverless service for hosting your containerized application. Suppose if you have a Docker container web application, that application you can run with the help of container instances it's also called a aci that is azure container instances so this is mostly used for deploying single container application means if i have to run a single app container or single website a simple website if i have to deploy i can use the container instances but if I have multiple containerized applications that needs to be run as a single group, like a microservices. In microservices, we will have multiple containerized applications. So if I have to run such multiple containerized application in a uh, uh, single environment, then we can go for a case that is Azure Kubernetes services. So AKS uses Kubernetes as a container orchestration service where you will be you will be deploying uh, multiple containerized applications uh, in a single cluster clustered environment. And we have virtual desktop which provide you a pre created pre-configured uh, environment just like a vm so if you have to do some uh, application development or poc you can use this virtual desktop now talking about this virtual machine just now we have created a vm so there is nothing to talk about this virtual machines much because you have seen how it is created so these virtual machines are using a virtualized environment because they are not the real computers. They are running as a virtual machine. They are using Hyper-V. So inside the uh, physical servers in the data centers, they, are, they have Hyper-V as a virtualization platform. And uh, on top of that, we have multiple VMs created. So whenever you request to create a VM, it is creating a new virtualized environment in the physical servers. So while creating these VMs, you can select the processor, memory, storage, and networking. So you, you must, I, I hope you remember while creating the vm i have selected the os type after that i have selected the machine size that is vm size 
like a two CPU with the eight GB RAM. Then after that, in the next page, I have selected the disk storage, like a premium SSD I have changed to standard SSD storage. After that, in the next page, I have selected the networking also, means what, what can be the name of virtual network, IP range for the networks, and also I have selected the security group IP addresses. So we have just skipped that option. I said, okay, we will go with the default option. So we didn't do anything on that. But yes, while creating the VMs, you have to configure the processor, memory, storage, and networking. VM scale set. VM scale set is also a compute environment which is providing a load balanced uh, group of virtual machines. That means usually when you create a virtual machine, it is creating a single VM. But what if you want to create multiple virtual machines with the same configuration? And what is your requirement is depends on the demand. It has to distribute the traffic across multiple VMs because if I have only one VM, then all my traffic will go into that single VM. So sometimes whenever the traffic is very high, it will not be able to handle all the request. So that's the reason we go for VM scale set. The benefit is it will automatically scale up, scale out and scale in based on the number of requests. Availability set. Availability set is a uh, high availability option in virtual machines. Suppose if you are creating a new virtual machine, they will ask you which high availability option you want. Means for making the VMs highly available, there are they are providing multiple options. If you see while creating this VM, we have already gone through this step. So in this step, there is an option for choosing the high availability option. So here you can see availability options can be availability zone is the default selection. But if you look at you have an option for availability set. So we have availability set, virtual machine scale set and availability zone. So if you select virtual machine scale set it is creating a group of identical virtual machines uh, with a minimum number and maximum number and you can also specify the scaling condition means if the cpu is uh, cpu percentage is greater than a particular number it will increase the number of servers If the uh, CPU percentage is less than a particular threshold, then it is going to reduce the number of servers. So it will automatically increase or decrease the number of servers. That is what virtual machine scale set. But if you see availability set, which means within one data center, within one availability zone, it, you can create multiple VMs, but they will be in different uh, fault domains. So what is this fault domain? So you can see whenever we select the option availability set, it will ask you to create the availability set. And while creating a new availability set, you can select the number of fault domains and update domains. So by default, the number of fault domains two 
and the number of update domains five. So you can increase the numbers if you have the proper subscription permission. So what is this availability set? So that is what we are looking here. So this is one of the high availability options. So there are three options for high availability. One is availability zone. Second is availability set, sorry, VM scale set. And the third is availability set. This availability set means inside the data center, there are multiple physical servers. And these physical servers are located in different racks. Okay, so different rack. And each rack will have a separate power supply and networking. Because they, if they provide a same power supply and networking, what is the problem? Whenever the power supply goes down, all the racks will go down, right? So to avoid that, they have created different racks and each racks will have a different power supply. And then when you create the virtual machine, these machines will be deployed inside this racks. But suppose if I'm creating three virtual machines, all the three virtual machines are not going inside the same rack. So suppose if I'm creating three VMs, three copies of the VM, first VM will go to rack one, second VM will go to rack two, third VM will go to rack three. So what is the benefit? If one rack is down, still you are able to access your applications from the other racks. That's a benefit, right? Suppose if the first rack, this is the first rack. If this first rack is down, no problem. You are still able to access the application from the other machines because the other machines are in the other rack. But understand all the three racks, which is mentioned here, all these three racks, are within the same data center. So what happens if the data center is down? If the data center is down, then all the three machines will go. So that's why we go for a higher option called the availability zone. Availability zones benefit is if there are three machines we are creating, first machine will go to zone one, second machine will go to zone two, and the third machine will go to zone three. So that if one zone is completely down, means one zone means one uh, group of uh, data centers. If those data centers or that zone is down, you are still able to access your applications and services from the other VMs because they are in the different zone so that is availability zone but availability set means within one data center we can create the vms in different different rack so we have already created a web server a vm and i have showed you how it is installed then Azure Virtual Desktop, that is another service. The AVD, that is Azure Virtual Desktop, is a desktop and app virtualization that runs in the cloud. It's a create a full desktop virtualization environment without having to run additional gateway servers. So it is providing you a complete environment for uh, using the Azure Compute VMs. So this will reduce the disk, uh, sorry, risk of re, uh, resource being left behind. So two multi-session deployments, like how we want to connect to a 
multi session servers like multiple users are connecting to same server and they will be consuming the uh, virtual environment which is already provisioned so in such cases we use the avd we have container services like if you have a docker containerized application you can deploy your containerized applications inside the uh, container services. So container service means you are not going to deploy the application code. What you are deploying is your Docker container. So Docker is a way of deploying your applications, right? So if you are familiar with the Docker terminology, you can easily understand this. Docker is a way to deploy your applications. So if you have your containerized applications, uh, or if your applications are already containerized, you can deploy these uh, containerized application in the Azure cloud environment. It can be a single container environment or multi container environment. Suppose if you are planning to deploy a single container, then you can prefer the container instance. But now the question, is it possible to deploy multiple container there? Yes, it is possible, but using the scripts not using the Azure portal. The AKS is another service. Suppose if you have multiple containerized applications to be deployed in a single platform, then you have to go for uh, the AKS. So AKS uses Kubernetes as an orchestration service because uh, you know, uh, Kubern Kubernetes is one of the most widely used uh, container orchestration service. So what is mean by container orchestration? So container orchestration means the life cycle of the Docker containers are managed by the uh, orchestration service. That means you don't need to go and uh, deploy these containers manually. Instead, the or, uh, you, you just need to specify the deployment script. So according to the deployment script, it will automatically uh, deploy the containers in appropriate servers in appropriate timing. So whenever you schedule the deployment, it will go and deploy that number of containers. The Azure functions. Azure function is a serverless service. What is mean? by serverless serverless does not mean server is not required so server is required then what is serverless serverless means at the time of creating the service it does not allocate any kind of uh, servers means any kind of vms but whenever the request is coming to the application it start allocating the resource and execute your code. That means when the request is hitting the service, at that time only it is allocating the uh, compute. That means the virtual machines. So I'll show you an example of how we can. Uh, Create and deploy an Azure function because it's a uh, it's one of the most commonly used 
é justo serviço. So let's go to Azure portal. So now I am creating a function app. Here you can see the function app. So what is this function app is? It is a group of serverless functions, means a collection of serverless functions. So first I'm creating a function app, that is the group is created. I can select the consumption plan. plan. Select the resource group, that is test group. Function app name, I can give synergetics function app, that's a name app using the runtime stack i'm select you can you see we can build your functions using different uh, languages so suppose if you have to execute a database operation or you have to perform a data streaming or you have to execute some kind of uh, background jobs like a backup something like that then you can use this function app so function app you will be writing the code of uh, to perform that particular operation. For example, whenever a new order is placed by the customer, we have to send a notification email to the customer. That means your order is successfully placed and you will get the delivery on this date. So for sending this notification mail, whenever the order is placed, you can use a function. So function will automatically execute whenever the order is placed okay and it will send a mail to uh, the customer's email id so for that we have to write the code for that and see it is not going to continuously execute because whenever the user place an order then only it needs to execute so that's why we are writing it as a serverless function. So I can select Node.js as the language because uh, that is JavaScript. So one of the easiest way to create it. Or if you are comfortable, you can use other languages like uh, uh, C Sharp, Java, Python also. Just a minute.
Yeah, sorry guys, uh, let's continue. Okay, so I'm getting some questions. I'll be ans uh, answering your questions uh, soon once this is completed. Okay, so, so I was explaining about the function app. So I'm just creating a function app with uh, Node.js as the runtime. That means all the code that I'm creating will be using Node.js. And it requires a storage account. So I can create a storage account also. And create it. Yep, you can see the function app is now getting created. The function app is just acting like a container, which means inside the function app, you can create one or more functions. So one function for handling the uh, orders, one function for sending the notifications, one function for updating the database like that. Multiple functions we can uh, create inside a single function app. Okay, you can see the resources are now getting created. Okay, so by the time I will answer the questions, what was coming, what is coming here? So the first question: If the data, if data will be shared on the location of the resources, then what is the use of resource group location see resource group itself is a resource so and every resource must have a location okay so resource group itself is a uh, resource that's why for resource group also we need to select a location but it is not mandatory that all the resources within that group must be from that particular uh, location only you can put any uh, uh, resources from any location into that resource group. Okay, so since a resource group itself is a resource, we have we have to select a location. So there is there is no restriction on uh, putting the location. Okay, for the resource group. So the badge details. Okay, that. Is, Archie will be sharing. Okay, so if you have to work on the subscription, so Azure account, first of all, you can create a free account. Free account in the sense of uh, you can create a free trial. Free trial is uh, Free trial can be created with your credit card. So you, if you have a credit card, you can create it with that. But you will get a one month two hundred dollar. So two hundred dollar is completely free. Okay, nothing will be charged from your card after one month. After thirty days, it will be automatically closed. It means your account will be automatically disabled. Nothing, no money will be deducted from your credit card. But if you don't have a credit card, then you have to means and if you are a student, then you have to look for a student option. So there are some free uh, options uh, available for students from universities. So you can uh, put your university credentials and other details and activate your student subscription. But if you 
don't if you are not a student and you don't have credit card then you have to appear for some microsoft courses so as part of the course you will be getting the free subscription for, for example if you uh, appear for az104 certification course course or az204 developer associate course so in that courses when you appear you will be getting subscription as part of the course which you can use it for one month uh, or one, uh, two months it depends on the course uh, type so you will be getting a subscription and you can uh, use it uh, means it, there will be a lab which is available so the the labs will help you to get good hands on on the azure services so that subscription will be part of the labs okay so that is another way so otherwise you have to go with the pay as you go model okay and in pay as you go model there are some free options some some of the services are available for free also because if you go to uh, some some services there are some free options available free free tier options available so if you go with that free tier options then you will be getting uh, you will be not charged okay because for example if you go for azure ai search there is a free service uh, for azure cosmos db there is a free option available okay like this uh, or even app service web app there is a free option available so that but there are limitations for free options but yes you can try out all the features uh, or all the services uh, with free so these are the free options you can use to avoid the cost okay okay so there is a question if we set three fault domains it will increase the cost no it will not going to increase the cost so this fault domain uh, you can increase if you are planning to uh, create multiple vms okay so creating and uh, depends on the subscription it will uh, allow you to create only specific number of fault domains only so in free subscriptions like uh, the one which which i am using uh, it allow you to create only two uh, fault domains max okay so if you want more than that then you have to upgrade to enterprise subscriptions okay so now let's come back and we have the function app created so this is the function app inside the function app i'm going to create a function here so here you will be able to see there are options for creating the functions so create functions in your preferred environment so currently there are no functions so i want to create the function using the azure portal itself or i can locally create using vs code and publish or i can use the other editors and the cli that is command line interface but i'll i don't want to go and try other options i'll just create here itself in the portal so i'll go to create function first of all we have to select a trigger type because azure functions are automatically executed whenever a trigger is fired for example whenever we whenever the user makes an http request it can trigger the function means it can start executing the function or if it is a blob trigger whenever there is a new file added into the blob service it can execute this but here i am selecting the http trigger for time being so i can select here i can specify the name of the function maybe i can give the name as sample http function and then authorization level i'm setting as function and then create so you can see it opens the sample http function where you can see the code and test environment 
Yep. So this is the JavaScript code. And if you want, you can update this code. So I, I don't want to update this code. This is a uh, pre-written code. I don't want to modify this code. Just leave this as it is. So this is what it is doing. Whenever I make an HTTP request to the function URL, it will execute this function. And what it is doing, if I'm passing a name along with the URL, it will say hello plus that name, and then say the function is executed successfully. If I'm not passing the name, it will say the function is executed successfully, but you can pass a name if you want to get a personalized message. Okay, so how to try out this? So what you can do, you can e either test here locally or you can use the function URL. So get the function URL. Okay, so uh, th the authorization level I have set as function authorization. So I can use the function key based uh, URL. So I'm taking this, copy this. I'll put the URL in the address bar and I'm pressing enter. I'm not passing any name. So what happens? You can see it is giving me a message that the trigger executed, that the HTTP triggered function executed successfully. That is, this message is coming. But it's saying that you can pass a name in the query string or in the body to get a personalized response. So I'll try with a name. So I'll at the end, I'm going to add my name. So name equal to Sonu. See, this time it is giving a personalized message that is hello plus that name and then this message, right? So that means whenever the user makes a request, HTTP request, that time this function is start executing okay so this is called the http trigger function so like this you can create different types of functions so currently we have only one function created inside the function app okay this is the function app inside the function app there is only one function created but if you are interested you can create multiple function for different purposes for sending notification email, for processing the data in the database, for uh, 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 handling the messages in the queue. So there are different uh, functions we can create here. So that is what the function. So function means it is a serverless service. You can write your code in your own language like C Sharp, Java, Python, multiple languages supported. So you can execute the operations that uh, need to be triggered. Suppose based on HTTP request, I have to trigger and execute. Based on a blob message, I have to execute. So like that, if you want to execute some operations in a serverless mode, we can use the functions. So you can see I have not created any VM, right? So it is running in a pre-created environment. So comparing the compute options, if you see virtual machines, it's a cloud-based server that support either Windows or Linux environment. So inside the virtual machines, you can install Linux or Windows operating system, which means you have full control over the environment you can decide what should be the machine's capacity what which which is the operating system type what is the uh, ip address everything you can configure because it is giving you the full control over the environment but if you see virtual desktop that is avd it's a provides a cloud based personal computer windows desktop experience that means like how we are using our personal machines, like a virtual environment, which is giving a pre-configured, pre-installed environment will be provided. So you can use how you are using your personal laptop. Similarly, you can 
connect and use the uh, remote environment. So usually our organizations and the day-to-day -day activities we can do using the AVD. Container services. It's a lightweight, uh, miniature environment well suited for running microservices. So if you want to run microservices applications, you can use containers because it is actually a miniature of uh, your VMs, you can say. Because it is actually giving you such uh, environment, but it is very lightweight as compared to virtual machines. So where this is useful, so virtual machines are useful for lift and shift migrations to the cloud. For example, if you have some legacy applications, so consider that our organization is uh, using some old applications which cannot be migrated to cloud uh, as it is uh, in, in our past services because past services mostly supporting the new versions of frameworks. So if I have an old framework or old application which is developed around 15, 20 years back, so that application is how I'll move to cloud. Because cloud is, cloud past services mainly support only recent application or recent frameworks, latest versions of frameworks. So legacy applications, if I have to move, then you have to use the virtual machine. So you create a VM, then install and configure the softwares manually, and then you deploy your application. So if you want to lift the applications and shift to cloud as it is, okay, you don't want to upgrade your application. Such cases you can use the VMs. Virtual desktop is dedicated applications to connect and use or accessible from any modern browser. So you can just use or connect it from any, uh, any of your machine, any of your device, and just use like your organization's or, uh, laptop or organization's machine. Containers are designed for scalability and resiliency through or orchestration. So like AKS kind of environment, you don't need to worry about the deployment, scalability, and high availability. In the deployment script, you just need to mention, okay, I want to deploy maybe three instances of my application. So it will automatically deploy three instances and also whenever the container goes down, whenever the container is crashed, it automatically creates. You don't need to worry about that. Okay, so that is what re resiliency means. Re resiliency means if the service goes down, it automatically recovers. So virtual machines, it's, com it's a complete operating system package, including the host operating system, which means you can decide which operating system to use. Okay, so that means it helps you to customize your environment according to your requirement. Virtual desktop is a multi-client login allows multiple users to log into the same machine at the same time. Like a, a server, you can log in to uh the machine so from anywhere and also multiple users are allowed multi-session is allowed so that's why multiple users will share the single machine like a server containers that is applications and services are packaged uh, in a container that sits on top of the host operating system multiple containers can sit on on one host OS. So in container case, how it is working is there is there is a virtual machine which has an host operating system. On top of that virtual machine's operating system, we will be running our containerized application. So benefit of containerized application is we don't need to install anything in our machines or in anything in our uh, virtual machines. It's all 
uh, all the application requirements like uh, the framework application code the database or maybe the configuration files everything will be inside the container itself so there is nothing to be installed on the host machine okay so that means within the host machine you will be able to run multiple containers so maybe one container of node.js type one container is java type one container may be a, a .NET core type so like this multiple uh, type of containerized applications you can deploy inside the container services and we'll discuss one more service that is app service so app service is a fully managed platform so what is mean by fully managed fully managed platform means all the configurations will be taken care by microsoft you don't need to worry about anything like operating system who will install and configure microsoft for backup and disaster recovery who will take care microsoft will take care scalability who will take care Microsoft will take care. Monitoring, who will take care? So Microsoft will take care. So that means it is completely managed by Microsoft. It's a fully managed platform. For what? Why we are using it? For deploying and building and deploying your web application. Suppose if you have web-based applications like the websites and web APIs, you can deploy the websites and web APIs within the app service. And this app service web application support different languages like uh, the Azure function we have discussed. This is also supporting different languages, .NET, .NET Core, Node.js, Java, Python, PHP, like this different languages it supports so that Suppose if you have a Java application, you can deploy in app service. If you have a Node.js application, you can deploy in app service. If you have a .NET Core application, still you can deploy inside the app service. So app service is a single pass platform that allow you to deploy any kind of web applications. So this will give you the enterprise grade performance, security, and compliance requirements. So whatever uh, features required for building and deploying enterprise web applications, you can get it from the app services. Networking service is one of the primary networking services, VNet. VNet is virtual network, which is something similar to the LAN, local area network, in our on-premise so in our on-premise environment we have a local area network the same environment we can create in the cloud using vnet and inside the vnet we can create multiple subnets and inside the subnets only we are deploying our virtual machines so whenever we want to deploy our applications and services we have to use the virtual networks because virtual network is enabling communication between the services suppose if one service wants to communicate with another service you must have a network because network is providing the ip addresses and using the ip address services are communicating each other so there are there can be public endpoint which is accessible anywhere from the internet okay so public endpoint means there is a public ip like the example of vm which i have showed you there is a ip through which i can connect to the application which is running inside the vm but where the vm is running vm is running inside the vnet there can be private endpoint which means i don't want to expose my applications and services 
to the public using public IP so that using private IP, I can connect them, but within the network. So within the network, one service can connect to another service using private endpoints. There are subnets which is used to create different segments means if I have to divide a larger network into small segments, we can use subnets. And we can also use the feature called a VNet peering. VNet peering means if I have multiple virtual networks, maybe in the same region or in a different region, we can connect them together using the VNet peering feature, which means if I have a network in US and another network in India, and I want to access the machines of US VNet from the India VNet, I can enable connectivity between these two VNets using the network peering. So these are some of the core services. I'm not continuing because it, uh, uh, it's a very, very vast list of services we have. But yes, uh, we have discussed the core compute and network services. Now, if you have any questions, you can post your questions in the chat. Okay, so here Praveen has asked a question, the difference between VM and VDI. So VM means it's a configurable thing that means you have to create it the operating system you have to select then you have to install and manage the applications and services the network you are configuring the security you are configuring because it is completely created by you but in case of vdi you are using a pre-configured environment you are creating a vdi instance means you will be getting a pre-created environment okay so in, and that means you don't need to install and configure anything the network the os and the other features everything is already ready you don't need to go and customize more yes customization is supported but you don't need to go and do much customization but in case of vm you are building the environment you are installing and configuring the OS, network, storage, everything you have to manage. So you can say these VDIs are actually VMs only. Behind the scene, it is VMs only, but it is created and managed by the Azure, means Microsoft. Yep, any other questions? Okay, Praveen, uh, do we need to study multiple clouds in order to be relevant? 
see once you learn any one cloud suppose whether it is aws or azure it will help you to understand the concepts of the other one suppose uh, so for azure if you are starting from zero suppose if it is taking one month to learn the azure services if you if you have learned the azure in one month for learning the aws you may just take five five days because the concepts remain same only the services will be different means you are uh, uh, here we have vm there it is ec2 here we have vnet there it is vpc so here it is uh, uh, app service there it is beanstack here it is uh, azure blob storage there it is s3 buckets so that means if you know the azure it is easy for you to learn the other cloud now the coming to the question whether it is required to learn multiple clouds to be relevant um, it's always a added advantage i can say it's not mandatory i'll say but yes if you are focusing and you want to become expert in azure only then you stick on the azure only but if you want to become an expert in the cloud cloud as a whole then you can uh, uh, go with the multiple cloud technologies even gcp also okay uh, as compared to market which cloud service is bet better see uh, depends so if you see the customer service and the uh, usage means easy to use azure is one of the most uh, easiest uh, and feature wise service because it is giving you the complete set of services because microsoft is obviously a product based company and this is end user focused so they makes things very very simple for people but in aws things are more complicated uh, if you if you learn aws first then you will feel very difficulty in learning but if you learn azure it will be more easy compared to the aws and usage if you say uh, organizations uh, means aws is there in the industry from last 15 years so obviously uh, the older companies were preferring aws or they were using aws for long time and uh, they are uh, still continuing with aws but all the startups all the new companies uh, or those who are planning to migrate to cloud they are mostly preferring the azure because it is more easy to use and also microsoft is providing better support than any other cloud service provider
okay so regarding the security see uh, security is one of the uh, common feature implemented in any cloud service you take whether it is vm app service storage network any anywhere the security is implemented so you have to learn all the services and their configurations to become a security expert okay so uh, but that is one of the good choice i'll say but uh, you have to have a good understanding of all the services then only you will be able to make a career on this security uh hello guys i shared the feedback form please before leaving the session make sure you fill this feedback form <laughs> 